All right, I do believe we are live. Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to yet another edition of Shimano School. My name is JP DeRose. Tonight, I am joined, obviously, by Bassmaster Elite Series Pro Greg De Palma to talk smallmouth, but he does have his fishing uh, liaison beside him, George from SFT Susquehanna Fishing Tackle. So, uh, boys, how are we doing tonight? Doing great. Yeah, we're doing awesome, man. <laughs> All right. So everybody who's going to be tuning in, as you guys get here, like always, I'm going to ask you in the comment section, let me know where you're tuning in from. Um, obviously, we're going to talk smallmouth after this northern swing, Greg, that we just had with the Elite Series. I mean, you guys fished arguably three of the best smallmouth fisheries in the world in the St. Lawrence River, Champlain, and St. Clair. So smallmouth's still on your brain pretty good, isn't it? I don't think it ever leaves JP to be honest with you. <laughs> yeah. It's a disease. The brown fish are definitely a disease. I will say that. Uh, Blaine Anderson, what's up? Uh, he's saying, great to see you, George. Kevin from Lancaster, Pennsylvania. How you doing? Chad from York, Pennsylvania. Uh, Tony, what's going on? Eric from Northern Kentucky. So guys are starting to roll in here, which is great. Um, nice. So I think there's a couple options we have. Thomas, how you doing from Springfield, Missouri? or Massachusetts, sorry, um, we got a couple options here. So we've got fall is around the corner. I mean, the cold nights are starting to happen in the north. I know that, I know everybody in the south is saying there's no reprieve from the heat. But for us, we've we've gotten a little bit of reprieve lately. lately. You know, a lot of storms rolling through, cooler nights. To me, I start thinking fall smallmouth, the shallow push, uh, you know, all those awesome ways we can catch them. So do you want to handle... Fall smallies, or you just want to talk about? We'll start off talking about what you just went through with the three fisheries. I'm I'm open to anything you want to do. <laughs> He's open to everything. Beeler, what's going on? Chris Beeler just checked in. Uh, Kurt, how you doing from uh, Deberry, Florida? Mike from he's he wants to talk about fall walleye. Not tonight, bud. Fall walleye are for dinner. <laughs> tonight we're talking about brown fish, brown and gold, same color, but wrong one. Uh, Edward, hope yeah, you're doing well. What's that? You know, you know the crazy part, JP, about smallmouth when it comes to the fall, and, and this is just, it blows my mind. So, you know, we just had the northern swing, which was, if, if you guys saw the weights, absolutely incredible. So yep. when the fall comes around, the number one thing they get bigger, but there's just more of them. It, it blows my mind that it can get better. That's the craziest yeah. part of it. Well, and it's just it's just like that, especially when we get past this. I find up here, so I'm I'm Ontario, but I have Erie, the St. Lawrence River, Lake Ontario, St. Clair, and Simcoe all kind of surrounding me. Sucks to be where I am, I know, but, uh, <laughs> yeah, but. you know, the thing I notice is as you get September, October, they can still be a few shallow, a few in the mid, and a few in the deep. But once you push and the water gets into the 40s, I mean, that's when things really – they all start to head to their wintering grounds. They all stack up by size. I mean, it's it's the fall of plenty once we get into the 40s for sure. Yeah. Yeah. You know. Go ahead. Bud. It, there's you. a couple of things that, that, that really excite me about smallmouth in the fall. Um, one of the things, honestly, that, you know, so the one downfall to fishing in the lead series is, uh, these past two years, I don't have the time like I used to to just travel up north and just go actually have fun. But, you know, when I did used to have fun a couple of years ago, I mean, for me, and I don't know about for you, JP, but the, the <laughs> jerkbait fishing is just, when you can wing that jerkbait down as hard as you can and they pull back hard and you hit that jerkbait, I don't think there's anything better than to be honest with you. I know, I know Blaine's watching. He's probably laughing because he's all about his big saltwater fish and makes fun of us guys all the time, but I'm sorry, Blaine. I think you're wrong on this one. <laughs> well, you know, there's no matter how you slice it, there's a lot of similarities uh, between nearshore and inshore saltwater than there is to smallmouth, walleye, largemouth. Maybe not so much largemouth because of the, the cover they traditionally live in, but the smallmouth, I find that stuff that I've learned smallmouth fishing, I can take to the inshore no matter what you're fishing for, even striper fishing for that matter, which is so prevalent in the Northeast. And you can apply, whether it's walking a dog, the difference is your bait's bigger, or throwing a jerk bait. I know uh, Beeler and Jack Sprangle got out and were killing the stripers on the re-range jerk bait. Oh, yeah. So, wow. yeah. So, I mean, it's it's really, you've got the sky's the limit. So, 
let's I'm gonna start you off with the St. Lawrence because I think that's probably one of the most confusing things for someone who hasn't done it uh, because of the current. What's the difference you find when you're handling current in a place like the St. Lawrence? What is that big thing? Well, you know, it, hand, handling current, you're saying just for the fall, or are you saying the St. Lawrence? In I general? say just in general. Just in so general. The biggest thing, the biggest thing that I have come to learn about, and this applies not only to the St. Lawrence, but any words for small amount in large amount that's current driven. So basically. The biggest thing that I can tell you is when when targeting fish in current is understanding the actual natural flow of the current because you have to match that literally to the T because in my opinion, there's a lot of areas in the St. Lawrence that I fish that a lot of the other guys fish right next to me and they were not catching me because they weren't matching the current speed with the drift speed that I was doing. So that's that's one of the biggest keys that I can tell you. And, uh, you know, we talked about this a little bit ago in the store. The St. Lawrence is a very windy river. It's got narrow spots, wider spots. Basically, every inch of that place can change current speed depending on where you're at. If there's an island where it necks down and makes it tighter, it's going to flow a lot harder. If it's a big, wide part of the river, it's going to flow, you know, slower. So you basically have to pull into an area. Like I told them, I, I pull into an area. I put the boat in neutral on a day that's just a normal day, no wind blowing, just natural current. And I see fast my boat drifts just by sitting there. And basically what I do is I'll put a waypoint on my graph per section of the St. Lawrence River of the actual current flow of what the speed was a mile per hour. And what I'm doing in drift, whether there's wind blowing or whether it's getting backed up, you, you want to make sure no matter what you're doing, you're matching that current speed. That's the natural current speed. Because that's how you're going to present your bait the most natural possible way. If you drift too fast or too slow, I can tell you right now, you're not going to catch the fish in the air. So that's the biggest thing. I said. Some great points there. Now, you, you've got George beside you, and I see Trey jumped on here, and he's like, uh, name another tackle shop owner that has fished two Bassmaster Classics. He says he'll wait for someone to do that. So uh, you're <laughs> at Tripahana Fishing Tackle, one of our great retailers, obviously looking – you're in, looks like what I would like my garage one day to look like. But let's, let's talk a little bit about what's going on. I mean, they're one of your title sponsors, correct, Greg? I mean, they've been they've been supporting uh, yeah, you for a number of years. They're, they're one of my longest running sponsors. And, you know, unbelievably fortunate early on in my career to meet Mike and George. I'm telling you, like, they're not only just my sponsor. They have been, they have been, like, brothers and fathers to me. I mean, they literally have taken me underneath their wing from start till now, and it's never going to change. I mean, they're going to be with me my yeah. entire career. Here. <laughs> so, yeah. So, you guys are actually lucky to have George on this live, in my opinion. So. <laughs> I, I hear George is the brain. He's the brains behind the product there. Incredibly knowledgeable. And I, I remember, George, you were at the Champlain get-together we had a few years back. Were you not? You came with the crew? Yeah, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's where I first met you. Yep. Yep, that's that was right. A, uh, that was a little bit of a smallmouth beat down. It was a little bit, yeah. It wasn't the fishing wasn't too bad. We got on some largemouth and smallmouth. A great fishery, Champlain, obviously. But uh, let's talk a little bit about what's been going on recently. I mean, you're sitting in a tackle shop, and I know recently it's been hard for people to get tackle. Supply and demand has been insane. How have things been at SFT for you guys? Have things been like? Has there ever been a surge, a resurgence, or an upsurge? in fishing participation with what's been going on with COVID? Oh, yeah. Uh, the first few weeks of, like, the the COVID bomb, we we just had unbelievable participation from, from new people into the into the sport. And uh, we were we're very fortunate. I mean, we had a we had a really heavy inventory and um, you know, for example, with, with all, all of you at Shimano, you know, we have a fantastic relationship with all your brands, longstanding. And uh, we were very fortunate to have a lot of product. And we've been very fortunate to get some product. Um, so we've managed to keep up. Um, we might not have, you know, the exact product that someone came in for, but we have something very similar and everybody's fishing. And it's a fishing, I mean, it's a, it's been a fever and 
here we are, how many months later, and we're still just hammered down up against the rev limiter. I mean, today, today was a prime example. Well, it's just holidays coming up. Everybody wants to fish. And a lot of these new people that came into the sport, I read somewhere the industry speculates 10 million new fishermen this year, fish people this year. And, you know, I, I don't have a hard time believing that. So it's been challenging, but it's been working. And, uh, you know, what's really exciting is the 2021 product line. We're starting to see a ton of 2021 products from Shimano, from Jackal. Um, and they're coming in and they're going out. I mean, we get a, a, we get an order in and it's gone. I think I have the, I think I have the last two gargles in the shop. I mean, they, they, they you might come might in the back door and they go out the front door, door quick, man. If they're gone, you might want to take them off the head banner on your web page because I'm looking at your web page now and it's right there. Yeah. You got the circle up there. So I know it's it's hard to react that quick. <laughs> well that and that's but you know what that's a testament. That helps. Good. Well, and you know, and that's a good thing. I think it's uh it's one of the bonuses that have come out of this disaster that's going on. That you know, people are yeah. spending more time outdoors, they're spending more time with family, which is always a good thing. And when you can yeah. take the family fishing. It's a perfect way. So, Greg, you've had this long-standing relationship, and I mean, I've worked in tackle shops. I've hung around far too many hours over my lifetime in tackle shops, and I know there's two types of fishermen out there. There are the ones that study every nuance of every rod, reel, line. They know diameters. They know materials. They know ball bearings. There's other guys that just love to catch fish, and they know what they like when they feel it. Which one are you? I'm a I'm a more of a feeler kind of guy. I cast out in real men. That's 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 kind of what I do. But you know, I, I'm 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 I don't want to say that I'm simple. When it comes down to being like technical, like what I just talked about, the current coming down, that's that's where I'm technical. But I with a rod, I pick it up, I feel it, I know what feels right, and I make it work for me. So uh, is that an what... example of? Go ahead. A prime example of what Greg's talking about is he's about the only person I've ever met in my life. That drop shots with a medium heavy seven foot two Zodia spinning rod. I, I have a different approach, and we can get into that too. And that's feel. Yes. So yeah, yeah we'll we'll talk about all that good stuff whenever you want to. But yeah, go, yeah, go ahead. Sure. Too, Sorry to cut you off. So well, you know, and, and there's there's something to be said here because I think you know we're seeing obviously an upsurgence in online ordering, and you guys have a great, very detailed online section for your store, as do many places, but. George is a guy you can lean on when you need to know the details. I mean, how valuable is it to have someone in a store that, you know, especially for a new person? I mean, Greg, you've been doing this a long time. You're like, so many of us can grab a rod, one flex on the floor. You know, it's got the taper, the power, the action you're looking for. But for someone yeah. new, how valuable is a guy like Greg having him in a store? So, you know, let me just let me just say from my standpoint. So, or George, I'm sorry. Of, <laughs> what's that? Go ahead. I said Greg. I meant George. Yeah, I know what you meant. So, we do a lot of outdoor shows together too, and you know, their 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 local following, if you will, is first off, it's unbelievable. Honestly, it's I've never seen anything like it. Whether it's their online sales or just the guys like who are walking to the store. But, so we do a lot of the outdoor shows and there's been so many different times where like, you know, being, being a part of the lead series does one thing. It allows to have a lot of guys walk up to you and, and want to talk to you about fishing. But like when we do the outdoor shows, a lot of guys after they make the purchase buying off of Mike and George, or even our pro staff guys, we have Corbin, Brian, Sadlock, very knowledgeable. Also, they walk up to me and they're like, man, I have never walked into a place where they're not trying to sell me something. They're trying to help me become a better fisherman. That's kind of the mindset that when I when I first started with SF. We have a little bit of a freeze up here. We'll see if we can get these boys back. A little bit frozen. Not sure if it's on the outside edge. I'm going to check on the outside here on Facebook. Uh, for those of you joining us tonight, there's been a bunch of you actually online. Good to see you tonight. People from all over the place. Uh, we are 
live, maybe frozen with Greg De Palma, Bassmaster Elite Series Pro, for another episode of Shimano School. So I hope everybody is doing really well tonight. Um, I'm going to check this on our site to make sure to see if he is frozen or if it's just on my end here. Yep, he looks frozen. So while we let Greg come back in, um, we'll deal with some stuff here. Here he goes. We lost him. So he's going to pop back in. I'm going to send him a text. We're basically talking smallmouth. We've been talking about uh, a little bit about retail and what's been going on with COVID because there has been a big upsurge in fishing participation this year, which is great. Uh, Greg did touch on. Here he comes right here. Back. JP, you we guys. Got you back. We got you back. So we, Good have job. A, we have a terrible storm. We got a huge right. storm hammering us right now. Timing is everything. So <laughs> how much of that oh, did you get? Did you get to the point where I said, you know, I was at the store, the shows, all that stuff? Yeah, you were saying when people would come back and from the shows and, and stuff like that. So continue from there. Yeah, so, you know, the SFT mindset, uh, you know, kind of what when I started, you know, getting on board with these guys, you know, they wanted me to understand that. It's not about it's not about sales. It's about basically helping people to learn how to fish. Because in this industry, I really feel like if you take the time to help somebody learn how to fish, they're not going to be somebody that just is you know somebody comes in your store and walks out. You're going to make a relationship have a long term customer. So that's kind of what like I, in my opinion, that's what SFT is all about. And you know George can tell you, it's just been. It's been unbelievable as far as you know they're following because I think that's the main reason why. I mean, in my opinion, uh, it's every little thing. I mean, just like this little broadcast we got going on here, we're going to talk about smallmouth, false smallmouth, how to catch false smallmouth. You know, if you if you can help someone learn and catch fish, you know, from our side, we're a tackle shop. We need a product. We're going to sell a product, and they're going to come back, and we're going to help them again with another aspect. Um, and I just think it's a full circle thing, you know, just like we're going to talk about catching these smallmouth specifically in the fall. You know, it's just one little slice. A guy falls coming up, somebody goes out, they catch some fish, they're coming back. They're, they're in They're And, and now with this COVID and all these new fishermen we picked up, it's even more important to make sure that they go out and catch fish. It can be simple at first, and then as you get more involved, you're going to get more driven to learn and get better. And that's where a, a full product company like Shimano with every possible rod and reel and bait and everything, power pro, and the whole, that, 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 that all comes together. I mean, if a guy goes from a, a sojourn fishes for, you know, three months and he's loving it. And, you know, next he wants to move up to a Corrado and then into a new Zodius. And we're teaching the tech along the way. That's how, that's just the way it works. That's just the way this industry should work. I agree. Yeah, I agree. And, and, and there's few of us left. I was going to say, there's not many like yep. these guys that I even, I don't even know of anybody else, honestly, that I can say is embarrassing. You know, no offense to anybody, I just no, my, no, it's it's yeah. nothing that like that. It's just there's 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 a uh, and 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 you know you can you can go into every region in this country and name off that shop, and and I know them all. I mean, and and they're all passionate. They're all they're long, they've been there for a long time for one reason. They're helping their customers catch more fish. You know, which we need to get, some, get doing here. I we, know. Need, we need to start. We need to start talking about some big old fall bronze. Oh, we're, 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 we're right about the head there. But I got one question for you, George, because this one will play in. There's a lot of new people, like you said, starting fishing, and I find I get a ton of emails. I'm sure Greg, you get the same thing, where someone wants to buy their first combo, their first rod and reel, not necessarily a pre-packaged combo, but their first rod and reel. From your experience, George, someone says, I want to try smallmouth fishing, maybe a little bit of largemouth fishing. What do you recommend? Let's just say, let's go with like a, a length and power of rod. What kind of reel? What kind of line? What are you What are you thinking? What's the recommendation? Yeah. And I'm leaning on someone who has probably helped tens of thousands of people do this. So, folks, you might want to listen to this one. 
it's 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 every day. I mean, it's all day, every day. And 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 what we talk about here with our staff is, you know, get that person's first rod to be extremely versatile. Now we're in smallmouth country. I mean, we have some great largemouth fishing, but we have the Susquehanna River here. So a lot of our walk-in customers are smallmouth fishermen. And, you know, really, 6'8 to 7'1, 7 7'2, 7 medium, fast, spinning rod all day long. And we, we, like to, we like to go with the versatility of braid because now you change from everything from a finesse bait to a spinner bait with just changing that leader. So, you know, we can go from a seven, we can go from a, an eight pound test leader and a little, uh, like Ned type bait to a tube. We can go to a, a 10 or a 12 pound leader and we can throw a spinner bait. Um, we can put a monofilament leader on. We can fish a buzz bait or a top water. And that person has one really good outfit. And the, the concept is, is that they're going to go out. They're going to catch fish. The next time they're ready for another purchase, they're going to come back in. And we're going to ask them, well, what was that last outfit you got? And the next outfit is going to be more specific. Now they're going to have a second tool in their, in their, in their, in their arsenal. That's going to be a little more specific. It's going to be a casting rod. It's going to be designed to handle that spinner bait. And it's going to be a little more generic of a casting rod, but it's going to be like a 7-2 medium heavy, a 6-8 to a 7-2 medium heavy. But it's going to be just enough flex to handle a crankbait and just enough backbone to handle a chatterbait. A spinner bait in between, um, a jerk bait. And they have their spinning rod. They can throw a smaller jerk bait on. So we're 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 looking down the road for that customer. And as that customer grows with us, we're going to get his outfits a little more specific, and he's going to get a little more hardcore because all along catching fish, and and it it it, it grows from there. It's just like it's such a beautiful thing to say. Yeah, absolutely, and I couldn't agree with you more than what you said. That's what I recommend as well, you know, medium on the spinning, medium heavy on the casting, get them set up. Even for light Texas rig soft plastics, that medium heavy seven foot to seven foot two rod is going to do a great job for them. So, yeah, the idea is get them a rod they can handle a bunch of stuff with because nobody wants to. Well, it's really Versatile. hard to explain to your wife. Yeah, it's, it's hard. It's also Versatile. hard to explain to your wife that I'm taking up a sport and I'm going to buy 13 combos. A little easier in golf, a little harder in fishing when you first start out. For yeah. sure. Uh, so here's an interesting combo. It's going to take 13 years to get there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, here's a question from, it's actually a comment, and I agree with this 100%. This is from William Barnes over on our YouTube Shimano channel. He's saying it'd be great if manufacturers of fishing rods adopted uniform standards for fishing rod actions and power, similar to the SAE API lubrication standards. So one of my bona contentions that I see when you go in between manufacturers is one medium heavy is not the medium heavy from another. You, I, I'm assuming you guys handle, George, all these brands. How how much of a variance is there in this industry? There's a lot. Um, you know, without, without naming brand names, you know, every brand has their own definition of power, and they have their own definition of taper. I mean, people throw around fast taper like it's – you know, the, the latest catchphrase, well, you know, a lot of rods are just generic, almost parabolic tapers, but they're labeled as fast taper. And, you know, some people's mediums are like other medium heavies and, and vice versa. And that's where, you know, we can decipher through the, the, the variations and the tendency to the brands and, and help to dial that customer into what they really need. You know, if right. they are, if they're very, very um, set on a certain brand and they, they really need a medium. Well, in that brand, it could be a medium light is what it says on the rod, or it could be a medium heavy is what it says on the rod. Um, you know, we're, 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 we're big with several brands. 
you know, and we're really big with the Shimano companies and their, their powers are very, very accurate and their tapers in some cases define those tapers that the industry needs to follow. Um, but yeah, I mean, what that comment, that would be awesome if, yes, if there was I a agree. standard, you know, in the industry for that. But there never will be. No. Um, so you really need to rely. And a lot of people don't have a tackle shop close by. But you really need to rely on that. If you have that resource, even if you're only able to get there a couple times a year because it's a two-hour drive or whatever, you know, make the trip when you're kind of having fever or something and you need to get, get, get ready for the season or get ready for the fall season and go in and, and rely on those guys to – you know, educate you on that. And All right, so we, you know, we got another one here for you. We're going to hit you guys on this one as well from Andre saying, why aren't slower reels made anymore? It seems, all seems 6.3 or faster. So you have a retail perspective. Greg, you probably have the angler's perspective. And not probably, you absolutely have the angler's perspective. So guys, let's handle this question in regards to today's fishing. First. I, I think you should go first because so, all you tournament guys are the ones that created this speed. So, so I, rec buzz. I, I recently had Mike Acor in my boat fishing with me, <laughs> and and Mike was throwing a swim jig and he goes, "Greg, where, where's all your slower reels?" I said, "I don't have any, dude." <laughs> I said, "Why would you have to just slow down the handle if you want to slow down?" So everything in my boat's like eight to one to eight to five, literally everything. I don't have. I, I own one seven seven gear ratio reel that's in my truck. Like, I don't even have it with me because my whole philosophy is like there's a wide variety, but the main thing is like reaction bite is huge and you need speed sometimes to really do that. And besides that, if I need to slow down, I'll slow my handle down because if I pick up a reel that's got a six three gear ratio, I feel like I'm not even moving the bait in my opinion. It feels like I'm overworking myself because I'm so used to the fast stuff, but that also in my brain, I know that I can just turn that handle slower and I'm good to go. It's it's really weird, but I don't I don't see the need for slow stuff anymore in my opinion. I, all them years them guys were using them crankly reels like that were four four to four to eight. Four or seven was fast. Yeah. I, I can't even like fathom that in my mind. I feel like my hand would fall off because I would just be starting to keep it going. Like I just can't I just can't do it. It's it's all about speed to me. I mean I don't know. I just got to have the fast up. And I'll just go, go, go. So that's just my personality. <laughs> I, I just think it's a prime example of the the learning curve that is driven by the tournament angler. I mean, you know, I come from a different era. You know, back in my day, my, my fast reel was 4.7 to 1. I mean, you know, that was my that was my high speed. And then when they came out with a 6.2 to 1 reel, that was like sorcery or something, man. And, you know, we, we've learned from the pros, such as Greg, and I was just shocked at, over the years to have some of these pros in here doing seminars talking about cranking ledges with 7 2 to 1 gear ratio reels and just grinding and burning. But, you know, as – Anglers, we all learn from these pros that, you know, we need to pick up the pace. We, these fish are getting a lot of pressure on them. And that fast reflex type situation. So lesson learned, man. I mean, the the, 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 sport, the, the tournaments are driving the, the sport and we're learning and the industry is responding. And now, you know, 6.2 to 1 is slow, you know. Yeah, it is. You know, JP, when I was just at St. Clair, and you, you probably have been there, you probably verify this. Like, you know, I was throwing, I was throwing a crankbait, throwing a DT16 and DT14. And basically, you know, I was throwing it on a Corrado DC, big old cranking stick, it was going to be a 7.6. I literally had to reel that DC, it was 8.5. I had to reel it as fast as I possibly could to get to the hit. point where I was hurting on my side. That's the only way I could get in the bite it, was yep. reaction. But it's a great way to catch some smallmouth that are heavily pressured offshore. Well, I, I agree 100%, so, Greg, because yeah. the difference between what we experience and what the pros are touring in is clearer situations than back in the day when cranking was big. 
you're talking coffee colored water in the south with red crankbaits and slower was better, right? It really was. But the other side of the coin is that back then when the first six to ones or seven to ones came out, they couldn't handle the torque of those reels. If you tried to grind a big deep diving, 20 foot diving crankbait, you would wear that gear out because the ratio was just too high. But now, I mean, with X ship in the reels and micro module gearing, Torque isn't the issue, which is, I think, why most people went to those lower gear ratios was the lower the gear ratio, they treated it as the torquey reel, and the higher speed reels were the fast-moving baits reels, but not as much torque. But it's not the case anymore, is it? No, not not, not at all. I mean, that reel, that reel, I wear out way before that really thinks about wearing out. It's, it's not even an issue. It's yeah. just, yeah, they're, they're built incredibly strong. It's just, it's actually amazing to be honest with you. Well, JP, right. when you consider that, you know, we take these bass reels that we're talking about here, and you've been on many of these tri trips that we go on, and we're saltwater fishing with these bass reels. Yep. They're the the gears in these reels, you know, here's the new Corrado 70. The gears in these reels are absolutely incredible. They they don't they don't wear out. The reel does not get that grindy, geary feel that like to your point, with cranking the big deep diver with the, you know, 10 years ago, you'd need yep. about five reels a year just to get through that season because you had a coffee grinder at the end of the, you know, five five or six days of that. Yeah. yeah. And, and that's true. And and now, you know, the gearing in the in the Shimano reel is it's incredible. I mean, the the way it's made. You know the the process that they make this gear with the with the cold forging, and you know you can get as technical as you want, but this gear at the end of the day to the to the to the consumer coming in the store, this reel, and I have a term that I use here at the store. This is a 15 year reel, okay? A Corrado is a 15 year reel. You, what that means is you fish this reel for 15 years. Yeah. I don't care how hard you fish it. So that's pretty impressive compared to what it was not that long ago. Yeah. All right. So now we're starting to get some smallmouth questions here that are starting to pile up. So uh, let's get back to the action on the on the brownfish because inquiring minds. Yeah, um, so Beeler right away asked what your favorite technique is. Are you sticking with the jerk bait? Is that your favorite way, Greg, to catch a smallmouth? What's your favorite and for the fall? For the fall, anytime fall, yeah, leaning into fall. What's okay? Let's let's keep things narrow because or else we're going to be all over the place. We're going to be pre-spawn, spawn, post-spawn. Yeah. I mean, it's gonna it's too wide of a of a field. Let's narrow it. Let's yep. go rolling into September and October. So leading in the well, fall. If there's no rolls, I'm I'm going to pick an A rig. I just think it's the best wow. thing, dude. It just <laughs> it's unbelievable. Like I I fish a lot of small ponds back home in New Jersey, which are large mouth lakes. But like there's a lot of days where you can't get in the bite, dude. If you pick up a, an A rig, I just I can't even tell you the drawing power. And I have small mouth fish with it. And you know when you're throwing that jerk bait or you're you're reeling a fish in on a drop shot or crank bait, and all the other ones that are trying to rip that crank bait out of its mouth. The A rig is the solution. You catch them all. You know, you get the whole bouquet. So I'm picking an A rig. I, you know, if I can throw an A rig from start to finish, we can't throw on an eight series. I would, I would have, I would be an A rig master. That's where I get technical because it's just unbelievable. So I'm picking an A rig. <laughs> yeah. Okay. okay. So, so the 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 misconceptions you hear about A rigs are they and they are uh, armful to cast. Um, what are you doing gear? wise rod and reel and line to help minimize fatigue when you're throwing an a rig yeah so you know they're they're really in my opinion i'm gonna go with the reel there's there's certain times to where i think a karate dc is a, is a necessary and, and you don't need it uh big crankbaits number one karate dc is there's not a reel on the market touches it same with an a rig a lot of times with an a rig you know, during the fall, you always deal with weather conditions. So for me, I always throw my A rig on a DC because there's a lot of times where you're throwing that giant thing where you will get a whip from the wind or something going on. And the DC corrects if I have a bad cast. I'm picking the DC. 
Rod wise, I usually throw my DCs uh, on a seven foot five Zodius, depending on how big of the A rig I'm throwing. Uh, generally, it's either going to be a 7.5 heavy, or if I'm throwing the giant swim baits, like you know 4.3 Kytex or bigger, I'll go to a 7.5 SD. That's used to two rods that covers it. Really good for me. I feel like I have plenty of casting power, and I have plenty of reeling in, you know, power of all the fish when they bite it. So that's that's kind of my combo. Generally, I'll throw it on a 20 pound fluorocarbon. So straight fluoro, you're throwing with your A rigs, and yeah, that that definitely does take a little bit of the shock out of. I know guys that throw them on 50 and 65 pound braid, but man, will that wear your joints out in a hurry? Yes, I couldn't do. It. I tried it before. I, I it wasn't yeah. for me. Me neither. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, it definitely does. Okay, so um, let's talk about smallmouth depths in the fall. So we're leading into fall. You and I spoke about this right at the beginning a bit about how you know as the temperatures drop. So. Are you following those fish as they transition from the shallows on those sunny, warm, you know, early fall days to the deep? What are you What are you concentrating yeah. on? Yeah, for sure. You know, and I think this applies honestly uh, to even more than the fall. A smallmouth. I don't want to say all the smallmouth, but a lot of the smallmouth. I really, truly believe they like to be shallow because they're they're sight fishermen. I mean, they feed off their eyesight, smell, and sound basically. Uh, you know, sometimes you get down really deep, it gets it gets dingy and it gets dark. There's a lot of times to where, and especially during the fall, you you literally can feel the sun on your back. Like you can feel the change in just your body can feel it. And I think a smallmouth feels the exact same thing. And I think, like I said, I think a lot of smallies will rush the bank. You know, zero to ten feet would be a really good range. If I had to pick a perfect, I said five feet would be really good. Um, yeah, so I, I would say, you know, the, the main the main spot I start looking for when that sun getting up, I mean I'm going shallow. That's just my my nature. I like to I like to see what I'm gonna catch. I like having the visibility myself. Um that's that's just that's that's my thing hundred percent for sure. Yeah, one thing I'd like to add to that is I do a I do a tremendous amount of, of late fall into winter fishing. It's a great time when you're in the tackle business, you're busy the rest of the year, so I'm not one to spend a full day in the shop during the winter. And I have been amazed what I've learned in the last few years um, of, of, of particularly traditional wintering type holes. I've caught a tremendous amount of fish in the last few years in two more foot of water in 38 degree water. Yeah. You know, if you have the right three day warming trend, and I think you really need to pay attention to your weather late fall. Into the, into the early winter portion, you really need to pay attention to the three-day rule where you get that three-day trend of stable to improving temperatures. On that third day, those fish will be shallow, they will be grouped up, and they will be feeding. And don't fall into that rut of where you've been catching them. If you're not getting bit, go shallow. And I, I couldn't agree more with it. Very you know, interesting. JP, if I had to, if I had to give one of the biggest tips about smallmouth, and this basically, and it applies big time in the fall, big time, because there's a myth with smallmouth fishing here today, gone tomorrow, and it's not a myth; it's true. And and the reason that is is because a smallmouth, I mean, is is such a forage-driven fish that when the bait leaves, they're instantly behind them, instantly follow them. So as fall progresses and starts getting a little bit colder, uh, you know, I was taught a long, long time ago to follow the wind. And that's really, really big because the water cools down, uh, you know, the, the fish, they don't move like they would during the summertime as far as activity. You know, they're, 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 they're cold blooded. So they slow down, obviously. So the wind is going to dictate a lot of that stuff. So if you're on a main lake bite and you're crushing smallmouth, and all of a sudden you got a tournament coming up and you know you get a northwest wind and it blows all the fish to the back of the pocket. I can almost guarantee you that smallies are right there within the top right. You know, so the wind is a big key in the fall. I've won a lot of tournaments locally by literally scrapping everything I got because I like George said, I followed the weather conditions. And that's literally what it comes down to most of the time with small mouth is it's just wind driven. You know, there's been so many times where I know that I got a really good area and I'll scan it and go fish through it and I won't get bit. And then conditions were changing up to the same exact spot that just came through even during the same day. Bam, there they are. I mean, the mega is going to move that much all the time, especially in the quarter months. 
For sure. Um, some good knowledge there for sure. Sorry, my pup's just, he tends to run in on me every time I'm doing a live. He just comes over to, I don't know what he wants, but he wants something. Um, let's talk about, Trey's got a good question here, actually. <clears throat> when the drop shot and when the Ned. So is it how the fish are relating to the bottom type of cover or casting versus dropping on them, all of the above? So when do you pick a drop shot? When do you pick a Ned? Yeah, so for me, uh, you know, a lot of times with smallmouth, and it really depends on where you're fishing at. You know, some fisheries are true smallmouth fisheries where, like, say, for example, you're on Lake Erie and you're, and you're drop shotting on rocky piles where you're using your 2D sonar, you're, you're phys physically dropping down. So if I can't, if I adjust my leader length to get them fish to bite on a drop shot, that's when I go to a Ned. And a lot of times on your 2D sonar, like if you've got a rock pile you're sitting over top of and the fish are literally sitting on the side or of that thing, a lot of times you have to have it to where it's laying in their face, not over their face. A small mouth, a small mouth is so I don't I don't want to say this wrong way, they're like a woman. They they just go they're they're up and down like crazy. No, no. That's just the truth of it. They're all over the place and, and you know, and a small mouth will tell you right away, generally nine times out of ten. And a, a small little tip too, like one time I was smallmouth fishing in a big event and I crushed him day one, day two. And then day three I got out there and I could not get any smallest bite. I finally got one to bite and I didn't change bait, I was still drop shot. I didn't change my baits and I finally got a smallie to bite and when I reeled the smallmouth in and got it to the boat, the front of the smallie was all bloody. And I, I thought instantly in my head, and there was no Ned rig back then, but I picked up a tube right away. In my mind I said, oh man, they're, they're actually eating bite you know, it, it switched that quick to where I had to make the adjustment. I threw a tube down on these same spots to start tagging them, and I absolutely hammered them when I couldn't even get a bite just by going from bottom to top or top to bottom. Yeah, they they definitely are picky that way. They tend to they tend to be that fish that will switch on a dime. Forage will switch, and then they're they're they don't even look up anymore when they're on gobies and crayfish. I mean, you could throw a suspending jerk bait over them, and it's hard to get them to chase it sometimes. It's unbelievable. All right. So staying on the Ned rig. So for you, what are you looking for in a Ned rig head? Is it the smaller hook? What size hook do you like? Uh, hook diameter. I, I like to set the hook pretty hard when I fish. So I always don't want those very finessey hooks because I find them too stubborn and, and I like hook sets too much to not take it easy on them. So what do you look for? And what actually... I want you to preface it with the setup you use to fish a net because that'll change everything. Yeah. So I'm just going to hop into the rod and reel real quick. So for spinning rod on my Ned, I generally always, I mean, I throw mostly all Zodius. So I'm going to throw a Zodius. I'm going to throw, throw a seven foot three medium to a medium heavy, depending. Uh, line wise, I still throw it on braid to four out. You know, I'll throw it on eight pound to maybe a 10 pound four, depending on how the bottom is. Uh, I use a little bit longer rod because I just feel like with a Ned, it just sticks a little bit better for me, uh, you know, especially in a long cast, obviously. I can cast a lot further, too. Uh, so for the actual Ned Rig head, kind of like my drop shot hooks, like I said, I, I kind of do stuff a little bit different a lot of guys. I, I like to have a really you know, thick, you know, wire hook because when I hit them, I want to hit them. Uh, depending on, you know, the size of the actual Ned bait I'm throwing, whether it's a small one or a longer one, that's just going to offset to match the bait as far as the length goes. Uh, and, you know, as far as this is kind of backwards, too, with a Ned rig, I, I, I really want to always force if I can. If I can throw something heavier Ned rig wise, I'm going to throw it heavier because it's actually going to allow me to throw more casts for the course of the day. But if I just can't get bit on like a one fifth head, I'm going to go down to a smaller head, obviously. But I throw a lot of the Z-Man heads, to be honest with you. That's, that's kind of the ones. And they have the, the thicker shine. Yeah, and all pro the series. Yeah, the pro series. They have yeah. you can get weed guards if you fish really rocky stuff. Uh, so that's kind of my tip. I just, I just try whooping their butt. That's what I try doing. That's 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 kind of how I do things. That's your style. Yeah. You know? yeah. And a small and mouth suits that kind of style. You can get aggressive with that. Yeah. 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 yeah Z-Man's uh, the original finesse rooms were a very fine wire. They work great, there. but you had to adjust your setup to deal with those hooks. And then they came out with that pro series, which had a stouter hook, you know, a forged black nickel hook that you could, you could lean into them a little better with. So, so now I'm seeing people pop up comments here about that. So Andre was saying 
you know, and this is this is what I everybody is different. Everybody, the way we all fish is different. The environment we fish in is different. So his advice by someone was said, you don't need to set the hook on a net. You just like a Texas rig, you reel, keep the rod tip down, said to keep the rod tip down. How true is that? I mean, I guess it all depends on where you're fishing and how you're fishing it and what species you're fishing for. It could be different in so many situations, can it not? I mean, there's a, a million different ways to approach the technique of fishing the net. Yeah, there, there's definitely, like like I said, I I kind of get a different approach. I, I kind of have a big swim approach. When it bites it, I want to reel it to the boat as fast as I possibly can. Unless I'm using like, you know, six pound test and I literally have to take it easy. One thing that I always talk about with George all the time with Shimano is, you know, their their drag system is incredible. There's not a drag system on the market that can even touch it. So one really good thing about having that drag system is you literally can set your drag to kind of offset, you know, whatever you're throwing, whether it's a, a thicker shank hook or a light wire. You can almost get away with using, I don't want to say whatever rod you want, but you almost can if you set your stuff up properly. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. All right. So let's go with... Kyle Campbell. So how do you fish smallmouth on a big river that doesn't have a lot of depth or structure? I know a guy, I know two guys <laughs> that have this answer. If you guys have never been to the upper Susquehanna River, it's a must, number one. But number two, that's all these guys do is exactly what that question is. George? All right, George, yeah. you're up. George, you're up. That's a big that's a big question, Kyle. Um, you know, in the early part of fall. You know, our fish and, and our Susquehanna River, so let me define deep for you, Kyle. Deep is if you put your rod tip in the water and it doesn't hit the bottom, that's deep. Shallow is right now we're catching our fish in eight inches to a foot of water. So early fall, they like big, large flats gravelly flats and the best way to to catch those fish is with a reaction strike so what i look for is a top water bite and i'm looking for sun and calmer conditions and a walking style bait um so you're gonna and a bigger a bigger walking style bait and then if i catch some clouds or i catch some wind in. I'm going to go to a, a spinnerbait, a uh, double willow, you know, jackal dune, whatever your favorite brand is. Long, long casts. The shallow fish, you know, is very aware of your presence. So you want to make a really long cast. I throw a longer rod. Um, as our fall progresses, these fish become obviously schooled up. And as the water gets colder into the fall, we start seeing again into the 50s, the low 50s. Now they start going for some depth. And on our river, uh, Kyle, we have a lot of ledge rock. So we have a lot of ledge, trough, ledge, trough. And you'll start to see those fish go from the flats to the troughs. And they're schooling. So now is when we really start to focus on the jerk bait. Um, you know, we have the re-range. We have different lips on that. You know, we start getting into some of these deeper troughs in the late fall. We're going to need the deeper, medium runners. Early fall, our troughs are anywhere, as I said earlier, even in the winter, two to four feet. Of course, we're going to fish more like a, like a, like a 110 re-range. Um, notice I didn't speak of any kind of finesse or plastic or spinning rod because it's not time for that yet. You know, when that water starts to get into the 40s and we start to get those colder, you know, fronts coming through from the north, then we're going to transition to the spinning rod. We're going to transition to an eight pound, you know, fluorocarbon a Ned style bait, uh, a tube, a small two and a half inch tube. And that's kind of our progression. And that's how we fish the shallow rivers. Kyle, I hope that kind of 
broke that down for you. That was one of the you best inches ever. Quick. Yeah, quick. Yeah, you got, you got it. George, you got it. It was it was pretty good. <laughs> All right, cool. So on that same talk uh, about that, Ismael's asking about, he's from Reading, Pennsylvania, kayak fishing in the Susquehanna. Uh, where's a good put-in for kayak fishermen? What area do you recommend? That's a, that's a river level thing. So start following your gauge. When the gauge in Harrisburg is four feet or lower, then I'd like to see you put in in the Duncannon area. Uh, if you're fishing solo, obviously you're going to put in on a boat ramp where you can do a big loop and take back out at that ramp. If you're fishing with a buddy, you know, you can put in at like the mouth of the Juniata and take out at Fort Hunter where you can put a float together. But once that river starts to rise and gets up into that five plus foot range, the current level on the river, Izzy, is a little uh, sketchy. And I'd like to see it on the higher river, focus on creek mouths. There's a beautiful boat ramp at the mouth of uh, kind of the Gwent uh, on the west shore there in Harrisburg. So kind of kind of focus on that stuff. And I think you'll do really well this fall. All right. Another bunch of good advice. And for those of you listening and tuning in, obviously, thanks for joining us for another Shimano School. We do appreciate when you guys can click the share button because that helps us get the word out. Uh, if you got a buddy who's interested or really isn't that good at smallmouth fishing, and we all have those friends that cannot catch the brown fish, tag them in the comment section. Put their name in the comment section. And this video is going to be available for everybody to view on both our YouTube channel and our Facebook channel. It's going to live there. So there is an incredible source of information for anglers from everything from offshore, canyon fishing, near shore, inshore, smallmouth, largemouth, I mean, walleye trolling, we've covered a bunch this year. So good opportunity to brush up on some stuff. So thank you again, everybody, for joining us tonight. We are at the 52-minute mark. We're going to go for a few more minutes here. Boys, we're, ri we're ripping through it here, absolutely tearing through it. This is a comment that I have to put up because I feel the exact same way. We were talking about hook sets a little earlier, and Trey said, I like to let them know they made a mistake. I think that's a good way to put it. When it comes to big hook set, you want to let the fish know they made a mistake by biting your bait. That's a perfect way to describe it. All right. So here's one. Uh, we're getting a lot of this, guys, which speaks volumes for, obviously, George and Mike, uh, your business you guys have. Most knowledgeable shop around. That's obviously a massive compliment. And uh, years of doing what you guys are doing obviously helps this. But here's one. Bring more bait finesse system rods to North America. And I assume this is aimed at Shimano. Greg, I'm going to throw this one at you because Zodius just really brought out a few of them that are absolutely prime with the, you know, the 7.6 LA and the 7 foot light Zodius spinning rods. Um, how do those rods play into and what would you pair it with for a reel when we're talking finesse fishing? Yeah, you know, well, just to jump on the rod real quick, uh, and I haven't used it yet for this, but that 7.6 that just came out, I cannot wait to spy bait with it. That's, that's the main reason why I want to be honest with you, because I just, I've been using a 7'3 mostly, and I feel like if I could get a 7.6, I could just get it out there so much further and just have that back then. You know, as far as a little bit longer rod, I don't know, you know like Trey said, the, I'd give it to him on a spy bait. I don't hold back. So, Trey, we're hitting hard on that one. But, uh, real wise, man, I don't have a new van for it yet, but Mike and George had them in the store and they're telling me that it's incredible. It's one of the best reels I've ever felt. And that's a, that's a big compliment because you guys have everything you guys make is incredible, number one, but that's huge. But I, I'm a, I'm a big sustain guy. I, uh, I love a sustained reel, a 2500. You know, I think it's just super light in your hand. So smooth, the cast a mile for a spinning reel. I'm, I'm picking the sustain for a 7.6 time. As I said, I'm going to use it for, for spy bait. That's the number one thing I'm thinking about today. It's funny you say that. I actually, I have one of the 7.6s here, and I have a spy bait on it. Uh, I've got mine on a Vent for 2,000, so we got that new size, which is kind of cool. You know, it's been a lot of years since I've seen a 2,000. George, you probably say the same thing. It's been a lot of years since Shimano's had I a 2,000. So it's, a, it's that 1,000 size body, but that deeper cut spool. Um, I've got mine spooled up with five pound power pro and I run a seven pound, 
uh, fluorocarbon leader. I mean, yes, you can cast it a country mile, Greg. So uh, the other thing I've used that rod for actually is deep water drop shot. And I found it to be really good for that. So uh, for Joseph, you're asking for more bait finesse systems. There's actually a BFS rod in Zodius and there is an X Pride as well. Greg, have you had a chance to fish the BFSs? George is nodding, so I know he's had his mitts on them. I haven't. George, I'm really super excited about it in the in the Zodius. Um, I actually brought a bunch of them into the shop before I even got a chance to see them because I already knew what the BFS was all about. Um, and it basically gives you the, the finesse of a spinning rod in a casting rod. You know, so you have that the backbone of, 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 a, of a heavier powered casting rod, but you have that tip section of a, of a finesse full spinning rod. You could actually fish your spy bait on that rod, uh, which we have on this rack right back here. So you might want to check one out on your you way. Bend that one, Greg. <laughs> <laughs> He's going to bend it on the floor. <laughs> no, that's, 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 pretty, that's pretty exciting. You know, and, and also, just to add real quick to 76, JP, you thought hair dig on yet? Like a marabou on it? Uh, yes. Yes. Yeah, it, it's it's really just, cool. it's it's perfectly, I liken it a lot to the 901, the Loomis 901. It's got that very, you know, when you load it up, it's got that even parabolic bend, but it the taper is incredibly fast for casting accuracy. So when you don't have a big load on it, just that tip is working so you can get a good, long, accurate cast and load the rod properly. But yeah, once you set into them, you get all seven, six of that bend in there. So it'll handle the light line really, really well in the finesse hooks. Yeah, it's a really, really awesome. Like it. It's a big lever. Yeah, yeah nice. absolutely. Um, so Trey, I know Trey is a big bait finesse guy. So he's saying that new Corrado, obviously the 70 MGL and the 7.2 medium light bait finesse rod. So he's saying like smaller poppers, jigs, heavier neds, shaky head, and a bubba shot being perfect examples of what you can do with that bait finesse series. Nice. That's, that's really good actually. Cause there's, there's been times in the past, I feel like, you know, when I'm throwing like a bait caster set up sometimes I felt like, and this is for me saying this, I, I feel like I ever had a hair. So like having this rod coming out, it's actually going to be in my arsenal big time. I think for sure. You know, we travel so many different places in the country that, you know, I literally run into every scenario you can think of. Yeah, multiple times a year so this is going to help for sure yeah and again with all the anybody who's looking to get there into there's a rod there bait finesse bait caster that's the new x pride with the monocoque handle but it's also about the reel you're going to pair this up with you're going to want an mgl reel right george i mean when you're setting someone up with that you want that mgl spool for that low startup inertia for casting these smaller baits yeah and that and that's great uh interesting point because you can you can put it on paper people can talk about it we can say low inertia we can say mgl but until you load the reel with line and cast it you don't really respect what that lightweight spool means i mean low startup inertia when you say that to 99 people out of 100 they're like what are you talking about well if we put line on this reel and put it on this bfs rod right here and put a eighth ounce on there, then you will realize what that spool is all about and why it's so important. And, you know, uh, not only can you get that on the Corrado, but the new SLX 70 yes. is coming with the MGL spool. So at that price point, um, that that thing's going to be a real player and that BFS rod, which is not a, not something, again, you can't read about it in a, a, a catalog. You know, and understand what that's about. About. Yeah. Those, this combination right here for the finesse guy that wants power. It's, it's incredible. Yeah. Um, so you're going to have to put line on the reel and you're going to have to cast it. And then, then you're going to understand what that's all about. That's the yep. best way I can describe it to you because you can't put it into words. Yeah. That's it, why it, a Corrado K is such an incredible reel. It transfers. Yeah. 
And, and again, for, for those of you who don't know, I mean, the MGL spools have been more pervasive in the entire lineup of bait casters that Shimano has put out. I mean, Bantam, uh, Metanium, Cronark. I mean, all of these reels have this MGL technology coming down from Antares and, and flowing through, kind of like what we're seeing in the spinning side, all that technology from Stella trickling down. You know, you're seeing Stella features in Saharas with a with a cold forged stamped gear, drive gear, right? So X it's, it's just part of that trickle down. X ship is another one, yeah. From from certain reels up, X ship started. I remember I remember working in a tackle shop. I was doing a spring sale and X ship had just come out on the Stella. This had to go back 12, 13, maybe 14 years ago when X ship first came out. And I remember just nobody understanding what two bearings did to either side of a pinion gear to help with torque. And I was fortunate because I saw it on the saltwater side before it hit the freshwater side. And I realized, you know, the amount of, you know, gear wear that was reduced and the torque it, it developed. But yeah, now we're just seeing those features come down and down and down and they're coming down in price, which is in my opinion, even more impressive because I don't, there's not many things in my life that I buy that have gotten better and gotten cheaper. I know for sure my cameras keep getting more expensive every time I got to buy one. So fishing tackle is one of those rare things that that happens. I mean, George, you're probably seeing tackle now that will dwarf three generations ago at less money. Yeah, it's, you know, when you have a company that uh, does their own R&D and then does their own manufacturing, Okay, you're going to you're going to get a feature that was mandatory in a fifteen hundred dollar spinning reel that was used to catch bluefin tuna X ship. You're, that's mandatory. And that you're going to get that coming all the ways down through the line. Now, when we're catching a two pound smallmouth bass, uh, are we going to torque the rotor that hard that the reel's going to bind up? No, but. Again, as I like to say, a 15-year reel, 15 years down the road, when you're still fishing that reel, you benefited from X ship, which was developed from a guy with an eight-foot rod on a boat popping for a bluefin tuna and his reel tightening up on him. And he's like, what problem? And, well, your rotor got torqued, your pinion gear got torqued, your drive gear bound up. Yeah. We can't have that. Well, do I really need that in my – yeah. You know why? Because a Stratix, a $200 reel, and I want to have that reel for a long time. I have Stratix that are 15 years old that I fish to this day. And I can hold the reel and spin the handle, and it will just turn and turn and turn. So we all benefit from those features. Uh, is it, like, critical for bass fishing for a two-pound smallmouth? No, but long-term? When you're enjoying the product, it sure is, in my opinion. Yeah, it's a longevity thing. It definitely is a longevity thing. So definitely a longevity thing. Uh, Greg, where are you off to next, bud? Uh, so we kind of have a, a three-week run where we have three events back to back. Uh, we have Lake Gunnersville, uh, then from there we go to Santa Cooper, and then back to Chickamauga. That's a tough span. Yeah, that's that. Yeah, that's some horrible water. Like really horrible and yeah. tough. Northern swing with all those brown fish to deal with, and now all these big largemouth to deal with. I feel really yeah. sad for you. <laughs> yeah. Well, up out there on the tour, yeah. it's well, it's not as easy as it looks, which you guys already know. But still, you know, it's one thing to go away and catch them, but you have to have like the best days of your life every day against these guys. It's incredible. It really is. That's it the it is. The competition is incredible for sure. For sure. It is. All right, fellas. Well, listen, I want to thank you uh, for your time tonight. Obviously, George, your wealth of knowledge. And for those of you out there, um, you know, head over, check out the, the SFT, Susquehanna Fishing Tackle website. Uh, if you're ever in the area, drop in, see Mike, see George. Uh, Greg might be hanging around in the parking lot somewhere, bending rods on the floor. I don't know, but it's possible. <laughs> <He doesn't. laughs> Thanks for the opportunity. And, uh, hey, Greg, you know. look at this. JP. This is what Greg does when he comes to the shop all the time. <laughs> Look at this. That's right. <laughs> what the hell's the matter with him? There's something wrong with that guy. 
<laughs> yeah, my, every, every time I come here, my boat goes slower. So it's like, you can never have too much tackle. <laughs> never. There's a tea on the water. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Well, again, guys, uh, we're getting lots of comments. Folks, uh, hopefully we answered all your questions tonight. Uh, it was a great show. Thank you guys for your knowledge and your time. Uh, Greg, good luck in the coming events. And uh, George, I'm hoping for you and Mike, things continue to rip right through the fall for you guys and you stay busy. So thank you once again. Thanks for the opportunity. It was a, it was a great time. And to everybody out there viewing, uh, what do they need to do? They need to hit like, like, and, 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 and share, share and yep. tag yeah, a buddy. Hit the buttons people or else these shows don't continue. <laughs> We appreciate Look at that. And Kevin Carpenter jumped in and said, Mike getting some airtime. You have to sneak it in right <laughs> at the end. <laughs> All right, guys. Have a great night. Thanks, everybody, once again. Like we said, both the YouTube channel and the Facebook channel will have this video. Help us spread the word. Share, like, click, tag a buddy, especially if you got one that can't catch a small mo. I hope everybody has a great night. We will talk to you guys soon. Thank you.